hello and welcome to another episode of the Odd Fellows Oddcast. And uh, joining me today on this episode is Jim Hobbs of the SoCal Pioneer and Historical Association. And uh, uh, Jim is a big fan of history and he has a connection to the research around our topic uh, the, for today's Oddcast, which is Charlie Parkhurst. And uh, Jim, do you want to just uh, let us know a little bit about your, um, you know, kind of like the reason why you chose to be on this episode? I contacted you to ask you if there was somebody who would be willing to be on this little odd cast about Charlie Parkhurst and you volunteered. So you want to say something about that real quick? Okay, well, thanks for having me. Um, I am the current president of the SoCal Pioneer and Historical Association. We're a, we're a group of people who try and uh, preserve local history um, and, and keep it so that folks down the road can know, you know, what happened and when and how and all of the interesting little tidbits of history. And uh, Charlie Parkhurst is probably one of the most interesting parts of our SoCal history. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I'm here today. Okay, well, thanks for being here. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. And uh, so Cal is actually like a very small town, right? You, you mentioned uh, in our conversation that SoCal and Aptos are like near San Jose, right? No, well, we're near Santa Cruz. Santa we're, Cruz. Only, Sorry. we're only two miles back from the beach mm. and uh, about five miles south of Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, cool. I've actually driven through there before, so I vaguely familiar with with the area but uh uh shall we get started on this uh, presentation that i put together that uh um i'm glad that i was able to do some research and put a few things together that i i hope that you'll have uh, an opportunity to uh share what you know of this uh research that i've put together charlie is uh an interesting figure now um in the different accounts that i have read about Charlie. There are people that refer to Charlie as he and others that refer to Charlie as she. And there, there's, it's all part of the story in a way of whether or not there's any ambiguity about it because um, uh, Charlie was, uh, everybody knew Charlie as a grown up, as a stagecoach driver, as a lumberjack, um, and a, a few other things that were uh, part of what someone who lived in the uh, Wild West during the formation of uh, California uh, around the gold rush era that, um, you know, Charlie was kind of a rough character, uh, chewed tobacco and, and drank with the boys. Uh, but there was an interesting discovery about Charlie that we'll get into as we go. And um, uh, that would um, lead to people referring to Charlie as a she because Charlie was born a girl. And um, we'll, uh, we'll get more into the details of, about that. Okay, so here we go. So um, I put this uh, slide together about who was Charlie Parkhurst because there are lots and lots of uh, articles that were written after Charlie died about how it is that uh, she, uh, the woman who fooled the West into believing that this stagecoach driver, and you can probably tell us a little bit about the stagecoach, you know, driving about how challenging it was. Uh, but uh, Charlie was referred to as one of the great whips of the gold rush era. And um, as it says on here, Charlie lived from 1812 to 1879. And um, Charlie also has a few other notable things because Charlie voted um, even though Charlie was not, I, I suppose, biologically a man, uh, when uh, Charlie voted for the president in, was it 1868? So um, this grave marker here, you're, you've seen this before? You're familiar with uh, this marker? Yes, I have. It's uh, in the Watsonville, the old Ottvello Cemetery. Right. And this says that it was uh, erected in 1935 by the Pajaro Valley Historical Association. Um, so um, we'll, uh, we'll go on to the next uh, slide here. So 
Charlie was also uh, known by a couple different names. One of them was One-Eyed Charlie or Cockeyed Charlie. And uh, the reason why uh, was because Charlie was kicked in the head by a horse. At least that's according to the stories that I've read. And um, uh, Charlie wore a patch usually. And this particular uh, portrait that somebody had done. Are you familiar with this portrait, by the way? Do you know its origin? I wasn't able to figure it out, but the credit went to Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. So I didn't know if you happen to know who it was that actually made this particular uh, drawing. I, do you? I do not. And I, I have certainly seen it before, but I don't know that anyone knows who actually drew it. Now, um, in my research that I had done on this, um, one of the historians says that there's only like one actual drawing of Charlie, and that would be this one. Uh, so this one was something that appeared in Harper's Monthly back in uh, 1898 when there was a journalist, this journalist here, uh, who was also the, the illustrator, if I remember correctly, uh, journalist J. Ross Brown, um, who rode with Charlie and uh, talked about how it is that you know, the stagecoaches were challenging uh, in terms of skill and also in terms of danger. Um, you were mentioning something when we were talking earlier about uh, Charlie's uh, exploits as a stagecoach driver. Do you want to impart any of those stories here? Sure. Well, I'd just like to say in, in, our, in our local lore, of course, there's a lot of mythology about Charlie, and uh, it's a little hard to to separate truth from fiction sometimes, but what we do know for sure is that the, the roads over the Santa Cruz Mountains, there was one road called Old San Jose Road that um, is very challenging. You know, it goes through over the mountains, goes through the little tiny valleys, lots of twists and turns, and uh, would have been a challenge uh, to drive any sort of a wagon, but uh, by the reports that I've gotten, Charlie was just an excellent, excellent uh, person with a team of horses and usually drove the stagecoach with a team of six. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and of course, in good weather and bad, and the, the bad weather can get very bad as you go over the Santa Cruz Mountains. So it, uh, it presented a lot of challenges to transportation. And there were also highwaymen. Mm -hmm. um, one of which Charlie shot and killed, mm -hmm. which added to his uh, notoriety or her notoriety. And, uh, and, and the other thing is there was uh, a lot of grizzly bears in the area at that time. Um, so, you know, there was just any number of things, ways for a trip over the mountains to go wrong. And Charlie seemed to be the person who could get you back and forth without much trouble. Well, um, I think that uh, part of the uh, allure of the Wild West was kind of how dangerous it was and what kind of a person you would have to be, uh, especially as a man, um, in dealing with, you know, bandits or, or you know, barroom fights. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that uh, Charlie would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody. So... That's always been the story is, you know, Charlie didn't walk away from a fight and uh, Charlie usually won the ones he was involved in. <laughs> well, obviously a pretty rough and tough character. I mean, I love the, uh, the cigar uh, in, the, in this depiction because I can't yeah. imagine, you know, having a, a, a smoking a cigar while driving through the wilderness, you know, with a team of six horses. It's like... Uh, my nerves would be too rattled <laughs> to try to pull off smoking a cigar at the same time. Uh, well, and I think I like the way the journalist presents himself. He looks like a white knuckle flyer there. White knuckled but, is absolutely the word that I would use because you can see the way he's holding on to that rail is like, you know, like his life depends on it, which quite literally, you know, it, it, it would. Right. Uh, so let's uh, go on here. So, uh, so the question, there's a lot of people that have had a lot of speculation about why uh, Charlie would be dressing as a man. So um, there was this really great uh, quote that I um, read and I, I copied and pasted it here. This comes from the uh, Rhode Island Journal. 
and it was reprinted in the Santa Cruz Sentinel back in 1880. And so it, was, it talked about how it is that uh, Charlie was an orphan. And um, when Charlotte was an orphan, uh, that Charlotte discovered that, you know, by wearing boys clothes that you could get away with doing more things, obviously more fun things than a lot of girls were required to do. Uh, and so somehow, you know, uh, Charlie, Charlotte left the orphanage with boys clothes and became Charlie. And uh, through the help of this Ebenezer Balch, uh, became a horse person and learned how to ride and learned how to drive uh, a stagecoach or a wagon. Uh, so uh, any, any particular comments about, about that early time when uh, Charlotte became Charlie? Well, um, I, I have heard and read some other stories that are sort of familiar to this, you know, and, and I think the point is that um, women were really constrained back in those days to, you know, their place was uh, pretty well prescribed about what you could do and what you couldn't. And uh, being out in the West, it was the place where people reinvented themselves. And I think Charlie just saw there were more opportunities for her, him, um, if, if she presented herself as a, as a young man. And, uh, you know, it's, it's probably one of those things that started out, she wasn't planning on doing that the rest of her life. I, I am purely speculating here, but, uh, you know, once, once you're established, you kind of uh, go with what's working for you. No, absolutely. Um, my understanding is that even though Charlie had very fine features in terms of, you know, hands and um, uh, another details, uh, Charlie wore gloves and also wore the loose fitting garb of the stagecoach driver, which allowed Charlie to conceal uh, whatever physical features that uh, Charlie had that would be a tell or a giveaway that um, uh, Charlie was not necessarily, uh, you know, a man. Uh, so that way he could get away with dressing up. And, uh, and as long as obviously, I mean, you know, back then one wouldn't think of a, a woman as being somebody who would chew tobacco and uh, smoke cigars and, you know, drink with the boys but charlie was noted as having a pretty high voice and um I, I guess that that certainly wasn't enough of a of a giveaway well apparently not but uh you know also the fact that charlie never backed down i think nobody was going to cross him because they knew it'd be trouble <laughs> yeah I've, I've read a couple very interesting anecdotes about Charlie that we won't go into all of them, but um, uh, it, it always amazed me that uh, Charlie was, you know, able to conceal uh, what Charlie was able to conceal um, without being found out any sooner other than after uh, Charlie had died. So, um, yeah, let's go on. So, um, one of the one of the interesting facts about uh, Charlie was that uh, Charlie had voted, and uh, so originally I had only read that there was documentation that Charlie had registered to vote. But there is a a historian, a very well known historian, that will be mentioning the book that um, uh, that historian wrote. I didn't have the historian's name here, but I'll, we'll get to it. Um, that uh, Charlie actually voted uh, for president back in. Uh, 1869. So um, you think it would be 1868, wouldn't it be? The election year uh, would be an even numbered year. Well, anyway, I, I believe I believe the voting would have been in 1868. 1868 the president right. would have taken the taken office, and you know, after the first of the. Year. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, there's, there's a plaque here, and it looks like it's. Uh, it's, it's the SoCal Volunteer Fire Department, 
this plaque here on the right, it says the first ballot by a woman in an American presidential election was cast in 1868 by Charlotte Charlie Perkhurst. And I find it interesting too, that people put Charlie with a EY at the end and sometimes it's an IE like in this case. Mm. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go on and, and see what else we've got here. Oh, this is one thing that I think that is important and it's just me being a stickler about details. And that is that uh, there are, uh, if you do a, a search for Charlie Parkhurst, you will see this picture, this one that's circled here, um, which is not Charlie. Uh, this picture is actually the picture of a, a criminal who was a member of the Butch Cassidy Wild Bunch gang. Oh. And um, I find it really annoying <laughs> that if you go to the Elk Grove Historical Society and you look at their website, they actually use that picture. And so it got oh. indexed. And so when you do a search for Charlie Parkhurst, you will see this picture. But yeah. you also see this drawing that I, I mentioned right. earlier. Uh, and um, also to the other only known rendering or drawing of uh, Charlie, right. which is the one that I showed before. Uh, so I, I just want to caution everybody that if you try to do any research, you will run across this picture and, you know, don't be fooled. That's not Charlie. Okay. And um, so one of the things that is interesting is that, you know, uh, there was this book that was written about Charlie, this one here, uh, that was um, Craig McDonald who wrote uh, cockeyed Charlie Parkers. That's this one here. It was almost 50 years ago that this book was written. And then since that time, there have been like over 20 books written. There was a TV episode that featured a character, Charlie, uh, and, you know, was a stagecoach driver. And there's also a movie that's in the works. And um, the thing that I find really fascinating about it is that people, you know, sort of like, for example, this one here, uh, The Whip, inspired by a true story. It won four awards and it's a fictionalized uh, telling of the story. And it was written by this Karen Kondazian. And she, when she was interviewed about this uh, story says, you know, that she would have done what Charlie did. And that uh, she says, I would have put probably put on men's clothes to be free like a man, which is completely speculation because we don't really know why Charlie did this. There, Charlie never left the diary or anything like that. So we don't know. And then she added this, this Karen Kondazian wrote, you can kind of use her in any way you want because we don't have the total facts about her. Well, I don't know. I don't know if it's okay to use her any way you want. One of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast was to kind of help to set the record straight for anybody who's doing any research that there are historians that have done the research on this. And while we don't know specifically an accounting from Charlie or one of maybe somebody that Charlie confided in about why, um, I don't know if it's really fair to speculate uh, as to whether or not Charlie identified as a man or as a woman, or, I mean, obviously we know that Charlie dressed as a man, but we don't know if that means that Charlie was a cross-dresser, right? We don't, we don't really understand or know the reasons for it. And so I wanted to point out that there are a lot of different stories about Charlie. For example, there's this one that's called Riding Freedom, which I'm pointing out here, uh, where Charlie falls in love and has a baby. And this was a fictional account um, but on the other hand, as we go further into the story, well, you know, maybe not everything that's, you know, life was imitating art. So we'll, we'll get into that in, in a bit. Anything that you want to add about all the different accounts of Charlie's life that are true, not true? Well, that, that just adds on to the difficulty of trying to separate fact from fiction. Um, it, it is, it's very difficult. And of course, like you say, some sometimes the fictional stories are uh, are are sort of uh, have a little more pizzazz to them. So you kind of want to grab onto those fictional stories. But I, I personally, I think the true story is uh, is plenty. Oh, indeed. I mean, 
the way that I look at it is that Charlie was an extraordinary, you know, human being uh, to do, uh, you know, uh, I was reading an account saying that like, there were only like six really great whips or, you know, these stagecoach drivers of the old West uh, before the railroads came in and basically made, you know, that job um, obsolete for the large part. Uh, and, you know, you couldn't be an ordinary person and do that job. I don't think that's possible. You'd have to have some really extraordinary horse handling ability, uh, nerves of steel or, you know, platinum <laughs> or something, whatever the hardest, you know, metal is that you could possibly have. Uh, it, it could not have been an easy job. And so, um, you know, my hat's off to Charlie Parker's for being, you know, having such incredible nerves for being one of these really great stagecoach drivers. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go on to the next here. So this was one of the uh, historical books for those who are interested in uh, reading a historical account on Charlie's life. And it was written by Ed Sams. And this was not the first book that was written. This book actually references the first book that was written by uh, Craig McDonald, which I will be providing that as well. But the thing is, this book is pretty inexpensive. You can pick it up for $5.99 on Amazon, or I think right now it's like $1.99 on Kindle, which is what I did. I bought it. And the actual book that this one referenced uh, is Cockeyed Charlie Parker's The World of the West's Most Unusual Stage Whip by Craig McDonald. This one is like over $70 for the paperback, or sorry, for the hardcover. And it was written nearly 50 years ago, like I mentioned. And um, Craig McDonald actually uh, has a talk that he does. He goes around and he, he does a lot of speaking. He himself uh, was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. And he's written, I think it's nearly 20 books that are all historical uh, books. And so he's, he's, he is an actual historian, unlike myself. And uh, he also says that uh, Charlie actually did vote and that uh, Charlie's coroner had said that uh, Charlie had given birth. And there's a little bit more to the story. Um, let's go on here. So um, let's I, talk, uh, go ahead, go ahead. I, I'd just like to clarify something sure. um, it, that gets mixed up in our local history uh, frequently is there's a, there are two Charlies the, and the, there's a mountain Charlie who was actually a different Charlie than Charlie Parkhurst. Mm. And uh, mountain Charlie, uh, if, if you go up out of Scotts Valley, which is another little town, there's a road called Mountain Charlie Road, which parallels Highway 17, which is the main artery between San Jose and Santa Cruz now. And uh, Mountain Charlie was actually the guy who built the, the Mountain Charlie Road, and he did it and put a, put a toll booth at the top of the road, and you had to pay your toll to keep going. Oh. So I don't actually know Mountain Charlie's last name, but his cabin is still up there at the top of the hill where he had his toll booth. Wow. And so I just wanted to point out that little clarification because people often get Mountain Charlie and Charlie Parkhurst uh, confused. Well, I can totally understand that. Um, so uh, I wanted to get into a little more uh, detail. And by the way, I am also going to be showing the video. Do you remember I shared the video with you? Yes. About, wanna... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share that because there's a really great story in this Craig McDonald is giving this talk um, at the Blackhawk uh, Automotive Museum. And this is a Vimeo uh, video, which I will share, I'm sharing the link. And uh, he's giving a talk about Gold Rush spirit and spunk. So Charlie is one of those colorful characters of the Old West. And so he included a little tidbit about Charlie in the talk. So um, I'll go ahead and, and, and share this here real quick. From other cities or Sacramento, different places, would have read papers and he'd fill you in on what was going on. That stage driver was Charlie Parkhurst. Charlie Parkhurst in the election of November 3rd, 1868, that saw Ulysses S. Grant become president. 
Charlie Parker's voted in that election in Soquel, California, near Santa Cruz. Charlie's buried, by the way, in the Watsonville Cemetery there. Um, the interesting thing is that many historians say that Charlie was the first woman to vote in the United States, 52 years before women's suffrage. And the reason was she wasn't really trying to fool people, but she dressed as a stagecoach driver. She was a rough, tough lady, and she wore the big coat just like all of you. Look at all the stagecoach drivers. She fit right in. She killed an outlaw named Sugarfoot one time. She'd get in a fight. She was one tough lady. You wouldn't want to cross her. Uh, but she loved children. Uh, just, just a very interesting character. When she died in 1879, there were newspaper headlines right in San Francisco all over the nation on how shocked they were to discover that she was a woman. Uh, she was very famous along the East Coast in Rhode Island and other states. Uh, just, just a phenomenal person. Uh, she, as I said, was buried in, um, in Watsonville. And under her bed, the coroner discovered a chest, a locked box. And inside that locked box was a baby's red dress. And the feeling is that she had been a mother at one time in her life. It's just an incredible story. I wrote the first national book on Charlie Parker's 43 years ago it was published. And there have been 20 books or so written after that. But it's just a really incredible story. And I think, and you won't hear this from any other historian on earth, that the reason the first woman voted in the United States was because this woman knew Ulysses S. Grant and she wanted to help her friend become president. And I can't prove it, but I think that Ulysses S. Grant rode on her stagecoach on more than one occasion. And I say this because she not only drove stagecoaches in the Mother Load area, but she also drove them in the Bay Area. And Ulysses S. Grant, no matter where he was stationed on the Pacific Coast, always managed to come back down to the gold country in the Bay Area in 1852, in 1853, and in 1854. But I wanted to mention, in the different accounts that I've read um, about Charlie, that there was this one that was an account by a major Truman who said that, you know, in different conversations that the Grants and some of the, you know, more prominent uh, people in early California uh, were passengers on uh, Charlie's uh, stagecoach. And so I, I believe this idea. And like, uh, like Craig said, he can't really prove it. But the reason why Charlie voted uh, for Grant was because Charlie knew Grant and, you know, would do whatever was necessary to support the Grants or, you know, President Grant uh, to get elected. So I, I certainly would believe that. And I would take his word for it because he's a pretty well-known historian and he's, he's obviously done enough research to draw that conclusion and to be willing to go out and on a limb and say that. So, um, um, now, so uh, I think that I did leave out one thing here. Now, um, a lot of people who are watching this probably wonder, what does this have to do with Oddfellows? <laughs> so I think it's kind of important that we don't wrap things up without mentioning what the connection is between uh, Charlie Parkhurst and Oddfellows. And the, the, the connection is, is that Charlie belonged to an Oddfellows Lodge in SoCal. And uh, just so that... Uh, you know, if you're, you're not familiar enough with Oddfellows, uh, you should know that they did not permit women to be in the regular Oddfellows lodges. Uh, they did have a very um, progressive uh, group. Uh, the Oddfellows did call the Rebecca's, which got started earlier in the 1800s and was like the first, one of the first, if not the first, um, large organization that women could join. And they had their own money. And, you know, like as a sort of nonprofit organization, they were one of the first to do that, to kind of empower women to, uh, you know, uh, do things that were charitable and, and have their own decisions about what they would do. So back then, that was a very progressive thing. Now, Charlie was not a member of the Rebecca's. Charlie was a member of the Oddfellows with the men. And um, the story goes that I have been told that when Charlie died, the coroner contacted the Oddfellows Lodge to uh, call the Oddfellows over 
and let them know that Charlie was biologically not a man and that uh, there were some pretty upset characters about the fact uh, kind of spoiled things for a few. Um, but uh, I can only imagine that it would really be quite a shock. And I, I think that it, as far as uh, being an odd fellow and knowing the odd fellows history and knowing that a lot of odd fellows would be really upset to know that one of their own was actually, you know, didn't have the same biological uh, essence of being a man as they do. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, kind of, it took a long time for the odd fellows to change their perspective with regards to whether or not to allow women into the lodges. We've been co-ed now for uh, nearly 20 years, which is really kind of a long period of time uh, to, to make such a change. Uh, and largely that change was because the numbers of odd fellows were diminishing to a point where whenever you would have really small lodges, it would help to have a couple extra people because you can't function whenever you get below five members within a lodge. So um, uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew and understood that the fact that uh, Charlie was an odd fellow um, and wasn't a man uh, was really upsetting to a lot of people who discovered that after Charlie had died. And um, I don't think historically that's really all that, you know, interesting of a point, but there is a connection to odd fellows. Um, we, uh, the Odd Fellows have a lot of people that are fairly well known. Like, for example, we have presidents that were Odd Fellows. And also, some of those presidents were members of, you know, uh, different fraternities like Masons and, um, you know, Woodsmen and, and, you know, those sorts of uh, fraternities. So, as a matter of fact, one of the things that's worth noting is that not only was uh, Charlie Parkhurst an Odd Fellow, but so was uh, President Grant was an odd fellow. And so was Schuyler Colfax, who is Grant's vice president, was also an odd fellow. And so who knows, you know, maybe one of the ways that uh, Grant and Charlie uh, knew each other and had something in common was that they were both odd fellows. Uh, but yeah, uh, so, you know, Grant was an odd fellow. Schuyler Colfax was an odd fellow. If Charlie was an odd fellow, it's quite possible that since Charlie was an odd fellow and Grant was an odd fellow, that they may have actually knew each other through mutual odd fellows. Yeah, well, I know my my brother is a very uh, avid Rotarian, hmm. and we never go anywhere without him meeting some Rotarian buddies, you know, mm -hmm. and it's it's that whole fraternal thing. Um, and so there's a list of people that are famous that were members of Odd Fellows. As a matter of fact, uh, the first woman dentist was a member of Rebecca's. And um, th that's another interesting story as well. A very accomplished uh, woman who, you know, um, became one of the first, you know, became the first dentist and was refused to attend uh, dental school because she was a woman. And uh, so there was a lot of discrimination of, against women back in that day. And it's really kind of, I think, a, a, a victory to be able to pull off what Charlie did. And uh, even so much to uh, fool all of the men that were in the Odd Fellows Lodge that uh, Charlie was biologically not a man. So um, I don't know if there's uh, anything else that we can uh, discuss, but... Uh, if you, uh, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is wrap things up, and I want to say thank you very much, uh, Jim, for being a part of this oddcast. I don't know if there's anything that you want to say in closing, but uh, I thank you for your time, and I thank you for your uh, knowledge and sharing with us what you know, and uh, it's been uh, great having you on. Well, it's been my pleasure, and I appreciate it, and uh, thanks very much. All right. Thank you.